six months ago. I'm sitting at a dinner table in a restaurant in Vancouver with three other girlfriends. The topic rolled around to vibrators and it turned out that one of us at the table had never owned a vibrator and it was like so shocking. Everyone at the table was like, you know, spitting out their wine and like, what? Totally shocked that this could even happen in 2012. And I remember the first time I ever even tried a vibrator. You know, I was shocked. I said, what? This exists and nobody told me until now? <laughs> so it's probably more of that uh, absolutely shock and, and but delight, absolute delight that, you know, that, that there's, these, there's these toys that exist. When you're young, the fact that you're having sex is the thrill. It's when you get older and you're more confident with who you are and you're willing to admit that, sure, sex is great, but maybe we can add a little bit more. So, you know, everyone's our customer, but our bulk of customers is a lot older than I anticipated. A lot of the nervousness about acquiring sexual products is, in, in my experience, around thinking that the first thing you're going to need to do is practically reveal every you're going to need to reveal everything about yourself in order to make that selection and that's the biggest relief is that it's not necessary. A minority of women reach orgasm with penetration alone, but that a lot of women reach orgasm, a lot more women reach orgasm with vibrators. We have always had sex toys. That, uh, they had, there's a, a Paleolithic sex toy, for example, in the uh, museum collection in Sweden. We know that the Greeks had dildos because they are depicted uh, on amphorae, those, those big jars that they have with the ears. The early mechanisms were actually pumped water. So you have like a hydriatic treatment that is, serves the same purpose as a vibrator. And if you have a shower massage, then you probably already know what I'm talking about. There was a steam power technology uh, in 1869. Uh, a coal-fired, uh, steam-powered, sort of a vibrator table. There's also an 18th century predecessor that was clockwork. But of course, the trouble with wind-up things is that they wind down. And then when electricity became available, this was another way to provide continuous power for the vibratory uh, aspect of the, the device. They did warn you well into the 20th century not to um, drop them into the bathtub or to use them in the bathtub. But they didn't say that early on, so there must have been people who did drop them into the bathtub, and I, I don't like to think about the consequences. I have since perfected my vibrator experience, <laughs> which is good. My favorite one is called the Magic Wand, which is just a sort of wand-like thing. It's great, you can take it in the bathtub because it's waterproof. I've had those little tiny ones, like the little egg kind of one, which is like meh, whatever. Or those great big long massage wands that are, you know, really for your back, they're for your back. And I've got cute little bunnies with little sort of ears that are like tickly kind of things, so it's not like a full on. <laughs> I have a, a rather interesting one that you actually wear while you're having sex. It's shaped like that and it, you just sort of put it in and then it sits against your clitoris while you're having sex. Like a toy does a lot of work, right? So you can kind of, um, yeah, you don't personally have to work so hard. You can just kind of like relax and anything that I can do to spend time with myself, like just myself, is really great because it takes a lot of pressure off your partner. Um, it makes you realize that sex belongs to you, actually. Your sex does belong to you, it, and you are responsible for it. You know, um, what a horrible feeling to expect someone else to be responsible for your pleasure. One of the things that has been really exciting and uplifting for me to learn is that so many of my clients who are in their 70s and up are having really fun sex lives. <laughs> um, they're doing really, really great things. They're communicating with their partners. They are uh, branching out. They're kinky. They're doing all kinds of um, wonderful things. And they're coming because they're often, usually because they're experiencing discomfort. And they're trying to find out how can I minimize this or eliminate this and maximize the pleasure. If you've had all your joints replaced and you're not very mobile and you know, maybe your partner's had a heart attack or two and you don't want really strenuous stuff going on. There's a lot of comfort and enjoyment in just lying and stroking each other. And being able to have that in your personal repertoire um, probably keeps people alive longer than anything else. 
I have a client who talks about how every day when she comes home, her husband will have a warm bath of water for her. And she puts her feet in it, and he just like lets her soak her feet. And then before anything, like before she sits down for dinner, before anything happens, he gives her a foot rub. And then, um, and I asked her, I'm like, is it, you know, do you have something with your feet? Like, is it, do you, do you have a lot of aching and pain? She goes, no, it's just my most sensitive part of my entire body and it's the most important, meaningful thing. And every year of my, like, our marriage, he's always done this for me. And so, um, and, they, and they haven't had any kind of penetrative sex in over 30 years, but they're, like, profoundly connected and deeply, deeply reliant on one another for um, having their needs for intimacy and sensuality met. Certainly as the baby boomer population bulge gets into later years, a lot of the thinking and trends seem to be coincidental with what's happening to that large population group. So I think there's going to be a whole lot more talking about seniors and sex as time goes on. <laughs> there are things that I will say when I'm doing my doing my thing as a nurse who's doing sexual health screening that will indicate that I am um, kink friendly, that I am poly friendly, and that I am body friendly. So I'm not about to judge anybody for the shape of their body, for the way they've modified their body. It's really important to talk about and acknowledge that there are a lot of different folks who express their sexuality in ways that might make other people um, feel a little bit shy or uncomfortable talking about. There was a whole sense that if you had a disability, there was no way you were going to be sexual. And, you know, that, that whole part of your life was subverted to the overwhelming, you know, problems related to your disability. Particularly, I think, for people with developmental disabilities, the conversation is still pretty limited. There still is a sense on some level that people are fundamentally asexual, even though we know that that's not true. At BC Women's, when I worked there, we actually set up a a program for women with physical and mental disabilities where they were free to come in and have their reproductive health care done. We had a woman who came in who uh, had pretty profound physical disabilities and during the course of all of the the work they were doing with her you know it turned out she was sexually active. She had a partner. Nobody had ever asked her that. She'd never had anybody ask if she needed anything or, or were things going okay and it turned out she had a few issues that needed to be addressed and at the end of the time when she was getting ready to leave she just sat with tears running down her face and she said you know this is the first time any healthcare person has ever treated me as a woman and I thank you for that you know with the tears running down her cheeks so you know, it, it, it tells us that we need to do more work about attitudes amongst healthcare providers um, and amongst people themselves to realize that there is no limitation on our sexual expression unless we put it there. And we tend to put it there way too often. Well, we do a lot of presentations and one of the things that amuses us from time to time is watching people when we present together because people know we're a couple and you can see the wheels turning sometimes you know that the the whole idea of well how exactly does that work you know and and we kind of get a kick out of it and uh, or even if it's not the physiological mechanics I think people are wondering well is he a burden yeah yeah, on a more serious uh, note. Well, uh, I, I get uh, that from time to time, you know, the, the you must be so wonderful, you know, or, uh, or, or it must be, uh, you, you must do far more than he does. Uh, or maybe, you know, did she ever desire being, you know, with a non-disabled guy? Those are the questions that hang in the air that, of course, no one would admit to. And I think... For us, we have such a, um, a different view of reciprocity and we've had to define reciprocity really differently because of our relationship and, and because of the, the differences in, in our physical ability to do things. So we have this philosophy in our relationship that everyone does what they do best and we don't try to remediate each other. 
I mean, the real reciprocity in relationship happens in that sense of being with each other. And when people sort of feel bankrupt in being, then they sort of turn to doing. And they said, you know, well, I'm doing all the cooking in this relationship. And what they really mean is the reciprocal, reciprocal flow of being is not there anymore. In the West, we have this thinking, this perception that we will fall in love and marry someone who is very close to us, who is almost identical to us in every way. But when you look at cross-cultural relationships, and these are the people who are from various cultures, maybe different races and religions, what I look at, the, the way I look at it with my clients is that they complement each other. Most of my clients are Caucasians, dating ethnic people, who I define as first, second, third generation immigrants to the West, someone who follows a collectivistic Eastern worldview and culture. Uh, I chose this profession because for a couple of reasons. The first reason being that I didn't see anybody else addressing this type of group of clients. Uh, the second reason is that I saw that there was a need. Uh, back in the 1990s in Vancouver, 21% of all singles dating were in cross-cultural relationships, but only 3% of all marriages were cross-cultural. So I thought that there was a need to address these issues that are preventing people from uh, having long-term relationships. When you take couples of different racial backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, and you help them understand each other's culture, understand each other's family dynamics, understand each other's cultural taboos as well as values to help nurture the relationship and create intimacy, further create intimacy in their relationship. That is something that, that really makes me realize that this is the right profession for me. Just like in music, there's always this build up of tension and then there's the big release and so you know in any relationship um, I think sexual tension knowing how to play with that using whatever you have whatever means whether it's a you know just your body the energy the sound the voice the relationship details that you you can share or all the all the other icings um, that you can bring into the picture color and decor and costume and that it's just totally up to the individual's creativity and I think that's that's what I love uh, about creativity is that you can bring it into every area of your life. When you're an adult, you're no longer playing like a child, but in sexuality, this gives you a chance to play like a child. It's a fun thing to play somebody besides yourself and, uh, and experience what that might feel like sexually. It's almost like I'm a producer of erotic film from a distance. I kind of um, am able to give direction to the ladies about, well, this is what you'll want to say, and this is the attitude you should take, and this is what you're going to be wearing, and this is what he'll probably say back, and so on and so forth. So it kind of fleshes out the scene for them, and then I kind of have little mental, you know, camera going in my mind as to how this is going to work itself out. Good Dag Porn exists as a place for people to be able to express their authentic sexuality. Porn in general is tends to be rather inauthentic. It uh, has images, especially traditionally lesbian images are the mainstream image of what women together is not really what women do together. And so it was created as counter to that, to be able to, which, because what I classify in the mainstream lesbian porn, that's bad. <laughs> so I've created good dyke porn. I wanted to be able to expose myself to a variety of different expressions of sexuality and see how I felt about it, basically and potentially uh, have that impact my own um, sex life, sexuality, and it hasn't really changed. <laughs> I'm still kind of the same 
pretty much vanilla <laughs> sex person. <laughs> I, I'm like proudly vanilla pornographer. <laughs> An aspect of the scenes that I create for Gedeg Porn that I absolutely love and I think would be useful in sex education is being able to see the communication between the partners, be able to see somebody say, hey, can I do this? Would you like me to do this? And then having seeing the person say, yes, I would like that or, or no. You know, my partner and I talk about sex all the time. We talk about, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, we try new things out all the time because, you, you know, you don't want to, I don't know, you just have to. You have to keep moving, you have to keep changing. Because people keep moving and keep changing. So, you know, right down to like your body changing as you get older. It's like, oh, okay, well, oh, we can do things that we can do before. Now we can, it's different. Or like, what about that? And, you know, it's, that's fun. Like that, that can be really fun. But it can also be challenging too because, you know, when you're in a long-term relationship, you know, people, people don't necessarily go through the same feelings or changes at the same time, so. Most of the people who come to me come for a sexual issue. Uh, they, they think that they have a sexual uh, dysfunction. But when we start our counseling sessions, an interesting thing happens. What we do is instead, what I do, instead of focusing on the symptom, the sexual symptom, I go right to the relationship and go deep down into the relationship and look at what is working and what is not working. And usually when we find the root of the relationship an issue in, of intimacy, for example, and we try to work on those things like trust and commitment, and by the time we finish that, the sexual issue that they've come for is no longer apparent. We have a number of old and antique vibrators um, and they've come to us through a number of different avenues. Some we've bought, found at flea markets, but the vast majority of them have come to us from customers. My grandmother died and we were closing out her place and I found this and I was really surprised that she had it, but it looks really old. Would you guys be interested in it? Uh, early on, you basically have a housing with a motor and then you have a business end and you have some kind of handle either for the doctor or for the patient uh, to manipulate. Two things that I think are really, really interesting in our library and one, the, the first one is just so much metal in it from the day that I don't think there's that much metal in cars now. It's so heavy and it's cast iron, it's got these big rubber feet and it's, you, it's like old school kitchen appliance like a pan mixer. I love that one because say, how, who can even hold this, let alone use it? In the, in the 30s, you sometimes see these very streamlined, elegant looking vibrators in plastic housings. Once it begins to be possible to use plastic for the housing, then you have a little more creativity about w the way the thing looks. There are also vibrators later on that look like, um, like, like uh, the streamlined trains of the 1950s. Uh, there's some that look like the automobile designs of glossy steel. The other one that I'm really interested and fascinated by, it, it doesn't actually plug in, it screws into, so you unscrew the light bulb and you screw in the vibrator as your power source. So it's sort of pre-electrical outlets being really commonplace. Modern ones, uh, like the ones we saw today at Women's Wear, uh, are covered with silicone and they're, they have very nice soft flesh-like surfaces. But of course that wasn't possible uh, in the 60s. You just didn't have that material to work with. So the, the ones from the 60s are all these like hard plastic ones that look like, like rocket ships and they're not really, um, if it were a chair or a, a, another kind of tool, you'd say it's not very ergonomic uh, for sexual purposes. It doesn't, you know, you'd have to wiggle around it all, you know, you'd have to be kind of athletic to get it to work. <laughs> uh, but where there was a will, there was a way. So they, I'm sure they managed something.